So ketamine is a drug that has been around for many years. It was developed in the 1960s. The main purpose was to generate an anesthetic to some extent also a, a drug that would relieve pain. But it also has become clear that it is abused in uh, club settings and uh, for its uh, dissociative properties. So people found this attractive. And uh, there have been occasional descriptions of people who sort of lost control, but there was never a big study to really establish its addiction liability. And uh, recently, however, what has changed is that uh, some really interesting work in psychiatry has shown us that uh, ketamine has this potential of uh, being a rapidly acting antidepressant. And for that reason, many more people have now been prescribed ketamine. And so that question of its addiction liability has to be reassessed. Since we know it's a stochastic process, not everybody might eventually become addicted. So we have to test this. And our contribution is to use our knowledge about the neural changes in the brain of mice to put ketamine to that test. So we're gonna look, you know, first, does it increase dopamine? Second, does it cause the plasticity? And third, is it gonna to lead to compulsion? So that was that's our contribution to, uh, to this question. And was it already known or was it unknown whether ketamine causes this uh, dopamine surge in this mesolimbic dopamine reward system? There, there was contradicting evidence. Some people saw a little increase, some people did not see an increase. And I think that is explained largely by the absence of the appropriate tools. Mm. We did not have a tool that would, with certainty and with the fast temporal kinetics, allow us to follow dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and the VTA. And this is sort of how we got into it. It is the these newly developed genetically encoded dopamine sensors that allow us to translate dopamine concentration into fluorescence and allow us, therefore, to look at dopamine in vivo in freely moving mice in response to a drug or in other situations. And that, for us, has been a game changer. And that's how we sort of got into that project, because we could now really measure and visualize dopamine in the areas that matter. I see. So you actually have tools now where you can take mice and literally look inside their brain. And when dopamine is release, released, it literally lights up and you can see it. Yeah. So they, they, these are really, uh, it's a new generation of fluorescent sensors developed essentially by two labs, uh, Lin Tian at UC Davis and Yu Long Li at uh, Peking University. And what they have been able to do is they have to they took a part of the receptor, the dopamine receptor, made it inert so it wouldn't signal to the cell, but coupled it to a green fluorescent protein. And so whenever dopamine binds onto that receptor, it pulls a little bit on that uh, green fluorescent protein, which changes its uh, fluorescence. And you can then calibrate this and you see dopamine increases. And you can see that with very high specificity and very high sensitivity. And that for us has been really a game changer. This became available in 2018. Okay, so this is uh, this is new technology uh, that's very exciting. So you have this at your fingertips. And so what do you see? What is actually, what is ketamine doing at this critical VTA to accumbens synapse? Yeah, so what we do, we, we do inject this uh, D light, it is called dopamine light and uh, into the accumbens and uh, put in an optical fiber to monitor the fluorescence and then inject ketamine. And what we see is, yes, indeed, there is an increase in dopamine. But what was very surprising and, and in, in, in amplitude and how strong it was, was almost comparable to cocaine. But what was very peculiar is that it returned to baseline very quickly. Mm. actually during the time that ketamine was still in the brain. So it had this effect of creating a surge, but that surge was much faster than anything we expected. So that was the first observation. And so, so if you compare that to something like cocaine, what you're saying is you see a surge with both drugs, but the surge lasts longer with something like cocaine and it yeah. shuts off more quickly with ketamine. 
So with cocaine, the surge lasts as long as cocaine is in the brain. Mm. And with ketamine, it's faster and it, it, it actually is it stopped while ketamine is still on board. So the first thing we had to find is what makes that so, so how is that, uh, that, that search generated and why is it so fast? So for that, we then took advantage of other technology that allowed us to look at the firing rate of the self, the dopamine neurons. And what we saw is that the dopamine neurons, they did fire more and they were therefore at the origin of the search. But the cause for that was not at the level of the dopamine neurons themselves, but it was because ketamine inhibited the GABA neurons, the inhibitory neurons that are upstream of the dopamine neurons. So it felt in that third class that I described before of drug that work through disinhibition. But I again, see. the problem we had is that the GABA neurons, on the other hand, they remained inhibited despite the fact that the dopamine surge was terminated and the dopamine neurons were no longer firing. So we had a partial explanation, but we still couldn't explain why it was so fast. Okay, so, so the dopamine neurons are there. They've got all of these inhibitory neurons connecting to them that are sort of it, acting like brakes and preventing the neurons from firing inappropriately when they're not supposed to. The ketamine's actually disactivating the dopamine neurons indirectly by inhibiting the inhibitory neurons. Exactly. So this is exactly the disinhibition mechanism that you said this very well. And so what else is ketamine doing mechanistically and how does that start to tie into this puzzle? Okay. So then the, in order to, to, to understand why the, 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 its action was terminated so quickly, we, we actually sort of found out that it hits special receptors on the dopamine neurons that can silence those. These are a type of dopamine neurons, uh, dopamine receptors called D2 receptors, which couple to a potassium channels and hyperpolarized these cells. And it is through that mechanism that we have, uh, 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 that the search is terminated very quickly. So at that point, when we understood this, the disinhibition, increase of dopamine, but that dopamine then feeds back onto the dopamine neurons to activate D2 receptors and terminates that surge. Then we had an understanding of this initial step that happened. I see. So ketamine gets into the brain. It disinhibits the dopamine neurons by inhibiting the inhibitory neurons. You get this surge in dopamine release, but that very quickly shuts off because the ketamine is also inhibiting the activity through these other dopamine channels of the dopamine neurons directly. Absolutely, yes. So it's a, it's a complex that gave us the idea for the title. It's a dual action. It's an action of inhibition, but then inhibition again. And, and that uh, was for us a very interesting thing. So the question was, is this now a direct effect of ketamine or is it the, is it the indirect effect through the dopamine? And I think uh, the literature is still open. Some people say that uh, ketamine can actually directly activate these D2 receptors and others disagree with that. I think that is uh, still an open question. But the fact is that these searches are very fast. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you a very different sort of dopamine release profile and different um, dynamics in the circuit compared to something like cocaine. And you would imagine that that would affect the addiction liability of the substance. So how do you actually measure that in animals? Yeah. So the next step obviously is, do we see these drug evoked synaptic plasticities that we typically see with other addictive drugs? And we did a side-by-side -side comparison. So injection of cocaine, we had very nice uh, changes in synaptic efficacy in the accumbens. And with ketamine, we didn't see this at all. There was no drug evoked synaptic plasticity. And so that was already indicating that probably that search was so fast that it was insufficient to do that. Or there were additional mechanisms at play that prevented this, uh, this, uh, this plasticity from being induced. And it turned out that it is a combination of both. <laughs> And so the way we sort of uh, were able to get at that is by looking 
at the requirements of inducing that plasticity. And one of the key elements of that is a receptor called NMDA receptor, which is a receptor that binds glutamate and is at the beginning of many forms of synaptic plasticity. And it turns out that uh, ketamine actually is a drug that inhibits the NMDA receptor. So that is, uh, it, it was at the, what was explaining to us why we don't have this plasticity that we usually see with addictive drugs. Yeah, it, it actually kind of makes a lot of sense. Typically, when you take a Neuroscience 101 course and you start learning about synaptic plasticity, that's when you get introduced to NMDA receptors. And the basic sort of cartoon idea here is, you know, if one neuron is talking to another neuron, there's some level of stuff happening in the second cell. But if a bunch of neurons simultaneously start talking to that same downstream neuron, you get this extra receptor that comes into the scene. It's the NMDA receptor. And that's directly tied with a bunch of stuff that happens inside the cell that's necessary to physically reshape the, the synapses of that cell. And so ketamine, you're saying, was known already to block this receptor. And that, that seems to be a key thing here for preventing the type of plasticity that you tend to see with drugs of addiction. Absolutely. So the blockade of these NMDA receptors precluded the plasticity from being induced. That's a technical term we use. And the, the way usually this uh, plasticity is expressed is that the NMDA receptor triggers the insertion of the other glutamate receptor, which is the AMPA receptors, and that makes the synapse stronger. So you can measure, and that's something we did in this project, the ratio of the current flowing through AMPA receptors and the one flowing through M NMDA receptors. And when that ratio goes up, this is a reflection of a strengthening of the synapse. And that did happen with cocaine, but not with ketamine. Not at all or less? Not at all. So I that was the thing. So at the point that we were sort of saying, well, maybe we should be challenging the system a little more. And so we developed the sort of injection protocols that would overcome the fast return to baseline by giving injection ever so often, we were able to accumulate the dopamine searches and make them longer artificially by, you know, carefully, mm. each time it goes down, you give another shot of, of ketamine. And that then gave us uh, larger and longer dopamine searches that were comparable to the one with cocaine. And despite that challenge, we still had no plasticity whatsoever. I see. So even though you get the surge in dopamine, even though you can make that bigger by giving more doses of ketamine one after the other, the fact that this drug is blocking the NMDA receptor is preventing that next step of synaptic Absolutely. plasticity. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And are you? What kind of doses are you using here? Are they? Are, were they doses uh, designed to be comparable to what people would use in a recreational setting? Absolutely. So these are doses that are comparable to the recreational and well below the anesthetic. So we made mm. sure that when we give single doses, the animals would show a reaction as they also show with cocaine uh, of, of a sort of a moving a little bit more. We call this hyperlocomotion. But